we're going to give you a quick summary of the recent amendments to the Sectional Titles Act. The Amendment Act was number 11 of 2010 and pages 4 to 16 set out a total of 42 changes. Some sections were deleted, some were amended and a number of new provisions were included. Some of the issues are considered technical adjustments. Um, the rest can broadly be categorised either as registration issues or issues dealing with management. And the management issues, I think, can be classified under two headings. First, those with direct financial implications, and then the others, many of which do in fact have financial implications. Firstly, the holders of future development rights in terms of Section 25 must now cover the costs attributable to those areas. Thus far, developers on the opening of the register were able to stipulate how much, if anything, they would pay. But Section 25 2E has been deleted and a new Section 37 1B capital A has been inserted, which, on an analogy with the existing position relative to exclusive use rights, says that the holder of, an exclusive, of a future development right must pay all the body corporate's costs that are directly attributable to that area. The second thing is that levy clearances are now required for registration of the cession of rights to future development areas. Thus far, this was not the case, but in terms of a new section 25.4a, the cession can't be registered unless a body corporate clearance certificate has been issued. There is an automatic liability of a new owner for the current levies. You might remember that this was an issue which sometimes had to be dealt with by way of tripartite. There was no specific provision in the Act that stated that an owner takes over liability for levies from the date of transfer. Section 37.2 has been amended to specifically provide that provision. So anyone who owns a unit, who holds exclusive use rights, or who holds future development rights, when those rights change hands, the new person who takes over as the holder of the rights or the, or the owner of the unit becomes automatically liable for a pro rata share of the levies payable in respect of that particular right. Then there is provision in the Act for special contributions or special levies. Thus far, there was no provision in the Act. This was in fact dealt with in Prescribed Management Rule 31. Now, Two new subsections, 2A and 2B, are inserted into Section 37 to make specific provision for special contributions, which are defined as any contributions raised by the trustees other than those as a result of the budget approved by owners at an annual general meeting. Like ordinary contributions, these are payable when the trustees take the resolution raising the levy. Now, let's look at the other changes. Firstly, there's a clarification of the body corporate's right to apply to court for a unanimous resolution. The way the wording worked before, it almost seemed that if there was anybody whose, owners, uh, whose proprietary rights were affected, the body corporate might not be able to go to court. This has been amended to make it clear, as I believe was the position in the common law all the time, that the body corporate could or can always go to court to get a unanimous resolution if it's unable to do so through the ordinary voting process. And the median line has now been stated quite clearly in the Act to run through the middle of any door or window in a section. There was uncertainty for quite a long time as to whether it was the width of the wall itself that set where the median line was always, as seemed to be indicated by the wording, or whether the median line went through walls, uh, through doors and windows set into outside um, walls. Now that's absolutely clear. That's the position. The process of getting a section extended has been made more efficient. Firstly, there's been an amendment to make it clear that the deviation of 10%, which is the threshold in this process, is to be calculated by reference only to the section concerned. Secondly, um, there is a requirement that the certificate um, that as to how big the deviation is, by, is given by a land surveyor rather than a conveyancer which makes tremendous sense. And finally, if the deviation is in excess of 10%, that's the deviation in the PQ as a result of the extension, then instead of the, the bondholder's consents having to be lodged, a conveyancer must simply certify they exist. Now, going along with that previous amendment, the process for getting bondholder's consents has been made a lot easier. So in the situation where 
a 10% or, or more uh, uh, P, PQ deviation is the result of an extension, then this new section 24.6a will apply and it provides that the applicant for extension must notify all bondholders by registered post, telling them what's going on, telling them all the relevant details and giving them an assessment of the impact on their security. These notices must be sent by registered post, but if a bondholder fails to lodge an objection within 30 days, then that bondholder is deemed to have no objection and the thing can go ahead. The period for which Section 25 rights endure can now be extended. This is a period that is set by the developer on opening of the register when he in fact takes out those rights, but thus far there has been no mechanism to extend it. An amendment to Section 25.1 now provides for the extension of those rights. It's done by way of a notarial agreement in terms of which the body corporate authorised by a unanimous resolution agrees with the developer and with all bondholders that the period will be extended for as long as they decide. When a developer takes out exclusive use rights, he can't hold on to them indefinitely. He now, within a period of 12 months, has to cede those rights either to the body corporate or to the individual owners of, of uh, units in the scheme. And that is as a result of an amendment to subsection 25.5. There is an obligation on the developer or the holder of a future development right to exercise that uh, right in strict compliance with the documentation that was lodged at the time of opening of the register. And this has always been in the Act, but it's only applied thus far to the additional sections. Section 2513 has been amended to make it clear that it, that it now applies not only to the sections, but also to the exclusive use areas shown on those documents. Where the sectional plan shows exclusive use areas, the developer now must take title to them before the wording of Section 27.1 gave the developer the right. It said he may take them, take title to them. But of course, it's useless having registered sectional plans showing exclusive use areas and nobody holds title to them. So now the developer is obliged to take title to those rights. The vesting of rights in ex exclusive use areas um, in body corporates, which, which happens automatically when, in terms of Section 27.4b, when um, the holder of those rights no longer owns any units, is now not only free of mortgage bonds, but also free of any other form of registered real rights, such as a lease or a servitude. The owners who hold Section 27 exclusive use rights, uh, which um, in terms of the sectional plan are restricted in some way, um, they now are also, as are unit holders, restricted in terms of the Act from using them for any other purpose. That's the lot for this set of amendments insofar as they affect, um, affect management issues. Thank you very much for joining me.